Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Pods Moving and Storage Studios. It's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Thank you for joining us, America. George Camel, Ramsey personality, co-host of Smart Money Happy Hour podcast and the George Camel YouTube mega hit. Be sure and check out both. That's Camel with a K. He's my co-host today, Ramsey personality. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Canada's going to kick us off this hour. Scott's with us. Hi, Scott. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you guys? Better than we deserve. What's up? All right. So my wife and I have $11,000 in debt. Um, but we also have an RRSP line that we have not used since I worked at this job in about four years, five years maybe. Um, it has $4,000 sitting in it. Um, I was wondering if it would be a good idea to take that $4,000 out and then pay off most of that debt. I am not a 100% expert on Canadian retirement plan, but I'm almost positive that if you do that, you're going to get a heavy penalty and extra taxes. Am I not right? I haven't looked into it very well. Um, I'm almost positive. You? You're no. I'm almost positive it's like our 401ks or IRAs in the states. You're in here. We would get a 10 percent penalty plus your tax rate. Therefore, George and I would always tell you, don't do that. Yeah, I'm looking it up right now, and it looks like there are, depending on your province and how much you're withdrawing, there will be anywhere from 10 to 30 percent, just right there. Yeah. So that is unwise because that's yeah. like taking a loan out at 10 to 30 percent to pay off your debt. Okay. All right. No problem. I'm sorry. I it's, just. Uh, it's not yeah, much I money. It's not much money. So the damage in actual dollars is not huge, but percentage wise, it makes you want to throw up a little bit. Fair enough. Okay. You know, it's like I want to borrow $4,000 at 30 percent interest. Nah. Yeah. You know. It's not. It's probably not going to kill you, but it's just dumb. I mean, it's just the numbers, the percentage just makes you go, yeah. particularly the math nerd in me, you know. And the other piece of this is the behavior change, because it's not really solving the problem, which was we went into debt. And so I want to see you use your future income, sell stuff, side hustles, overtime, whatever you have to do to create that income to pay off that four grand. And truthfully, that's not going to take long. Yeah. You can do that. Yeah. Well, it, and 11 grand is the total. So truthfully, the whole thing's not going to take long. If you step into a really nice side hustle, you'll do that very, very quickly. But the big deal here is to stop the bleeding, meaning get on a budget, live yeah. on less than you make, be in agreement with your spouse, and then get in attack mode on that 11,000. And um, George is right. There's something happens in your brain when you quit. You're, you're, you're being wise looking at all options, Scott, but something cool happens when you quit looking for a shortcut. I would have looked for the shortcut, too. It's human nature to do that, and you should look for an easy way. That's, that's dumb. Don't do it the hard way on purpose. But in this case, the, the part of your brain that, that's going to make you do this the hard way is the part that's going to give you permanent change. The other piece is that will help you step off this ledge is looking at what four grand would turn into 20 years from now in your investment account. That'll make you go, I'll find another way. Yeah. That's a lot of money to unplug. Yeah, the, ten, the uh, 20 years from now version of me is going to be pissed off. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to do that. James is in Raleigh, uh, North Carolina. Hi, James. Welcome to the Ramsey show. Hey, Ms. Ramsey. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What's up? Hey, so a uh, particular place in life where I've got a year or two left on my education. My wife's got a year. We're both working full time and um, we're both investing in our 401k options and match options with our jobs. And we're, we know we're going to want to buy a property or a house one day down the road. Good. And so we're trying to figure out, like, do we go full 15% or more in our 401k and still try and save the house? Or should we put, like, try to nickel and dime and go as hard as we can with just getting our matches in our 401k options uh, and then put all we can into a savings for a, a house? Uh, like, which option would you which option would you guys recommend based on where we're at, maybe? So you guys have no debt in a fully funded emergency fund already? Yeah, no debt, fully funded emergency fund, and, and actually a good bit put away for each of our 401k so far. Awesome. Way to go. Well, that puts you at baby step 3B, saving up for that down payment. And truthfully, this is kind of a choose your own adventure. You could invest anywhere from zero to 15%. And the faster you get the down payment saved, the faster we get back to investing. And it really comes down to your urgency on getting into a house. Yeah. We don't want to put more yeah, than 15%, but anything less than 15%, 
while you are temporarily on the baby step 3b which is the down payment house down payment is okay so george is right choose your own adventure you could do the do the match and no more that wouldn't make a lot of sense you could do nothing and just pile up a big old stinking down payment for the next 24 months during that 24 months you're going to finish your educations probably get raises and set you up to make your house buy and then step back into that 401k with 15 percent and start paying off that new 15-year mortgage as fast as possible Huh, that's very encouraging. I, I just didn't know if it was bad to go down to just the match. I guess that was what my worry was. But it, if, it, it would was, be if you were so if you're trying to say back in baby step two, we would tell you to just go all the way to zero, regardless of match. Oh, while you're in baby yeah, step no, two, well, right? Well, back, yeah, yeah, back there where you're, you're you're had debt, but you don't have that debt, so you're sitting squarely uh, at this place where. It's a temporary thing. It's a one, two-year time period while you're saving for your down payment on your home. The larger the down payment, obviously, the smaller the debt, or the, hopefully you don't buy more house. But, um, yeah, that and that puts you in a position to, to really go win with that. Choose your own adventure. That's a good way of looking at it. That's how I have always seen it because there's really three options, 0% and really stack up or do the match, then stack up, or 15%. You can do somewhere in between, too, but most people do one of those three options. I personally like trying to hit that mark of 15% and then getting even more intense on the down payment, but I'm just wired weird. Well, and, you know, I would I might say which one I like more based on how old I was. Okay, He if sounded I'm, super young. Yeah, if I'm in my 20s, I'm good to go zero because you got plenty of time for compound interest to kick in on the, on the investing later. But, again, we're okay. Ramsey, the Ramsey way is choose your own adventure, zero to 15, anywhere in there. But I could go to zero easier when you're 25 than when you're 55. Mm. And you, you know? have a lot more to catch up on. Yeah. And you exactly. really want, you want to get in that house. Exactly. Exactly. But, uh, you know, there's two major things, folks, that we find with the millionaires that we've studied that cause them to become millionaires. One is steadily investing in retirement and good mutual funds, 401ks, IRAs, all right? steadily over time investing the second thing is a paid for house those two are the biggest two elements that we see cause people to be a millionaire the typical millionaire we studied was 51 years old they had like a million and a half to two million dollar net worth let's say they had a million and a half dollar net worth in our case study uh that you we usually would find they had like a half a million six hundred thousand dollar paid for house and then they had like seven eight hundred nine hundred thousand dollars in their 401ks um, and so that's generally how we saw them getting there in that first one to five million dollars worth of net worth. Those are two big things. And there's a lot of reasons that those two things show up with millionaires all the time because A, they're both really good, good wealth building tools, but B, they uh, follow the idea of slow and steady wins the race, not the hare. The tortoise wins every time I read the book. Never read it once and they went, hare scores this one. No, nope, you don't get to choose your own adventure in that puppy. Uh, the tortoise wins. The ugly, steady, slow, not bragging turtle wins. This is the Ramsey Show. Hey guys, being free to make your own medical decisions is a big deal these days. Christian Healthcare Ministries gives members the freedom to choose the doctors and providers they want without the frustration of worrying about networks and with no waiting period to join. It's a membership-based nonprofit ministry where hundreds of thousands of Christians share funds to pay for and pray for each other's medical bills. For over 40 years, CHM has helped families living across all 50 states. So see if CHM could be right for your family. Check out more today at chministries.org slash budget. The Ramsey Show question of the day is brought to you by Neighborly, your hub for home services. Neighborly is the place to find reliable help for your home, 
from trusted, locally owned businesses like Mr. Appliance, Mr. Handyman, Precision Garage Door Service. Great company. Visit Neighborly.com today to find home experts that you can trust that are available to serve you. Today's question comes from Michelle in New York. With student loan payments starting again soon, I'm hearing a lot of people talk about an unintended consequence will be a big hit to the economy. With that money going to student loan payments instead of being spent at retailers, they're saying maybe this could drive us into a recession. Do you see this happening? No, it's not enough money. It's not big enough relative to the size of the gross domestic product, the GDP. So there's not a big enough tail here to wag this dog. Mm. So mathematically. So I, no, I don't see that happening. Um, and and let, let's just say it did. Walk so us through what? this. So what? Like these people don't need to pay their bills just because we might face a risk? No, absolutely no. So, and here's how we also know it didn't create a recession. Did you notice that, have it, that all these people having all this money to spend did not cause a boom? That's true. If you had an extra 400 bucks, with the it wasn't cost. enough money to cause a an economic boom when they were all blowing it on vacations. As a matter of fact, one study came out last week where Jade and I were reading this the other day. He came out and said that uh, like 80 percent of the people spent all the money on vacations, retail, drugs and alcohol. Wow. And even. Well, I mean, if there's a recession in the cocaine area, that's probably okay. I can deal with that. If there's a little, if there's a little crack recession, I think we can handle that part. But um, I'm thinking the alcohol retailers are probably okay. They made enough money during COVID to last them about ten years. Oh, they made out like bandits on that. Oh man, it was the big. I mean, remember the wine bottle stacked up and oh, the pictures right. of that at the curb during the, during the during the COVID quarantine. That was like when alcohol delivery became hot. Yeah, I like, yeah. can't leave the house. You bring it to me. Yeah, it was, and, and lots of consumption was a big deal. Yeah, I'm just saying. So anyway, all kidding aside, it didn't cause a boom, so it won't cause a bust. And that illustrates my po- earlier statement that it's not enough money relative to the size of the economy to tank the economy because it didn't make the economy, so it won't break the economy. So, uh, however, what it is going to do is it's going to put a pinch On the 99%, I cannot believe this number, 99% of the people that didn't have to pay payments on their student loans didn't pay anything on their student loans. 1% used all of this chance at no interest to get out of debt. 99% took the approximately $15,000 per person that it saved them and blew it. And it's gone. And, and now they're going to go, oh, no, my budget's tight, just in time for Christmas. Well, and the scary part is a lot of people got refunds from their student loan servicer. So the student loan company says, that one's hey, me. here's your ten grand in payments back. The government will forgive it. You'll be fine. They give them ten grand, reinstate their loan balance, and lo and behold, no forgiveness. And that puts them in a real pinch if they spent that money. Because most people said, well, I'll hold it in savings. Humanity has told us that we don't make great decisions when we just have a pile of money sitting there. So that's really scary. And also people who bought really expensive cars in the last few years, really expensive houses in the last few years, who now have to make those payments on top of student loan payments. So could that cause some foreclosures and repos? No. You know, the people that went over the edge on stupid are always going to get caught. Mm. Uh, I, I did that once and I got caught. So, you know, you're just stupid will catch up with you. It's, it's got a it's got a real. This pat- is like your, your skinny dipping line. It reminds me yeah. of that one. Yeah. When it was actually Warren Buffett. So it wasn't mine, but I stole it. Yeah. You can tell who was skinny dipping when the tide goes out. So there you go. The and tide is going out, people. That's what's happening. Prepare here, yourselves. So. Get clothed. Yeah. But I think I think you're safe, Michelle, from a recession. Uh, may, maybe not a personal recession, but certainly a national recession. Kim is with us. Kim is in Tucson, Arizona. Hi, Tim. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, George and uh, David. So I'm so happy to be talking to you right now. Um, I have just so much gratitude and want to to call and say thank you for helping. Um, I just paid off all my student loans. Um, (laughs) You're one one of the 1%. Yay! (laughs) Yeah, and um, oh my gosh, it's been such a journey. Uh, It feels like for years and years and years I was trying to stay, well, that's a little, cut off one of those years. For years and years I was trying to figure out how do I pay off all my student loans. I felt like I was you know, I made a great salary, but every year I'd get my, you know, W-2 and I'd be like, oh my gosh, what did I do with that money? 
Um, and I was just living, you know, I, I, I was trying to have a budget, but I really went, I didn't do a zero based budget. I just went with like, all right, if I want to continue living my life, then how much is left over for paying off student loans? Um, and it really wasn't an effective way of managing that problem. And so I got really tired of it. And actually I, um, I just, I I met the man I'm going to marry and it really kicked me into gear on getting my finances taken care of because he, um, you know, he had all of his finances taken care of. And so I wanted to bring that to our relationship and have all of this cleared away before we decided to get married. And so um, I got into gear last July. I really got serious about the baby steps. And um, in just one year, I paid off the remainder of my student loans, which was $45,000. Wow. And um, definitely missed out on like buying new clothes and, uh, you know, taking a vacation. Um, I could have, could have, you know, it could have been nice to have some retail therapy, but um, there were a couple moments where I did celebrate, you know, bigger milestones and, you know, with, you know, three, three loans left, I took myself out shopping and, you know, gave myself a a conservative budget um, and made the most with it. But um, but yeah, I just am so grateful. It's a little, you know, it's a little unreal that this is that I've reached this goal. But um, I honestly, like, I've reached out to so many different financial advisors um, along the way. And this was the most um, effective method for paying off my student loans. And Way I did it go. before forbearance went back in place or or uh, the government, you know, stopped the forbearance. So <laughs> Way to go. I'm proud like of I you. <laughs> how's, how's it feel to be free? Oh, my gosh. Um, you know, what's amazing is that the cash is mine now. Mm-hmm. And I am so much looking forward to this is going to be the first bonus um, that I am not putting towards debt. And I like... Oh, there's just something about being able to keep that money that brings me so much happiness. And like, this was so worth it. And, um, you know, I was scared to stop retirement contribution. That was like the one thing where I was like, oh, (laughs) I guess I'll do it because it's like $600 back in my pocket. Um, But, you know, those were the things that I decided temporarily I will make those changes. Um, and it worked. And and it worked. Yeah. And one year and later, you're investing more than six hundred dollars. Yeah, one year later, and I honestly, I thought that this was going to be at least eighteen months. Yeah. But once you get you know what else I, it, you know you what else I'm find... hearing in your in your uh, sentence structure and in your voice is I think you have a newfound confidence. You believe in Kim more now. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh, Steve. <sighs> That's so true. I just, oh man, that is so true. And I I just felt like being in debt kept me in a rut in so many different aspects of my life. Yeah, and you not only kicked $45,000 to the curb, you kicked shame to the curb. Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. Good for you. all of that. So when's the wedding? Thanks. Oh, um, there's not a date. First, the engagement needs to happen, but oh, that's coming around the okay. corner. So, right. but you're th- you're that confident. That confidence is now oh, yeah. bled into your relationships. Like this is the guy, for sure. Oh yeah, we've we've been ring shopping and all of that. So yeah. that's all in place. Yeah. <laughs> wow, what a year you've got! I'm so proud of you. Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks. Hey, thanks, thanks for so calling much. in. God bless you. That is absolutely amazing. You know. When you understand that personal finance is 80% behavior, only 20% head knowledge, you understand that you permanently change while while you are getting out of debt. Mm. It's a different you on the other side of it because your behaviors have changed and it changes who you are. Her confidence level, like we're talking about, the shame is gone. 100%. In one year. Transformation. Yeah. It can it. happen for any of you out there. This is The Ramsey Show. If you're like most people, your home is your most valuable asset. And when you want to make improvements, it can feel like everything costs too much or takes too long. 
but something as simple as custom window coverings from Blinds.com can completely change your space and add value to your home. We've recommended Blinds.com for over a decade, so you know you can trust them. From blinds, drapes, and shutters to motorized shades, they make it easy and affordable to upgrade your entire home, and their team is ready to help with everything from design consultation to measuring and installation. Plus, there are never any misleading quotes or hidden fees. Everything's backed by their 100% satisfaction guarantee, and shipping is always free. See why Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings. Go to Blinds.com now and save 45% off selected products. Visit Blinds.com today for more info. George Camel Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Hey guys, uh, you can help us out if you'd like. You are our best marketing, telling your friends about us. And you can do that by sharing the show, share, hitting the share button, sharing a link, or just telling people where you listen, uh, however you're doing it, whether it's YouTube or radio station, TBN, it doesn't matter. We'd love to have you tell people about us. And uh, you can use the technology to do that, or you can use your mouth to do that. I don't care. Thank you. You can subscribe and follow, depending on whether you're podcast, YouTube, whatever, hit the click button. It makes a big difference if you actually do that, because it, it changes the way the algorithms work, and it pushes our show forward for other people when they're searching to find it. And so it changes the search engine, so, so to speak. And so uh, please help us with that by subscribing, sharing. Oh, and leave a five-star review. That's always helpful, too. And uh, we've let, gotten some really nice reviews. People are nice. Yeah. There are really nice people out there. There are. And the trolls, they'll always be there. Just ignore them. Well, there's never been a statue erected to a critic. <laughs> That's Not that I can think of. So just keep that in mind. If you're a critic, keep that in mind. You may not want a statue. But you just need to know that, in other words, people don't admire that, the fact that you live in your mother's basement and troll all day long. I, mean, I got to get my mom to leave a review because she watches on TBN every day. Oh. And she now sees it on a big screen. She says, you need to smile more. Oh. So I got to remember, mom, you're watching out there on TBN. Thanks, mom, for yeah. the media training. So she's my biggest critic right now. Yeah. Well, and your biggest supporter. That's true. She's a big fan. It's all in love, George. That's true. She loves to critique. Mama Camel. <laughs> and Grandma, too. We got Grandma watching TBN now. Yeah, well, and, and Mama Camel's getting ready to be a grandma. That's right. Yeah. We're on Baby Watch, We could change Dave. her name. That's right, yeah. All right, Jonathan's with us in Charlotte, North Carolina. Hi, Jonathan. How are you? Hey, how's it going today, guys? Better than we deserve. What's up? Absolutely. So uh, I've had a tough couple of months. I got laid off, but oh. the light is at the end of the tunnel, mm -hmm. and I got hired last week. With Yay! A, um, Better job, awesome I bet. Job. It's, I almost doubled my salary. Whoa! Thank God you got laid off. <laughs> exactly. So that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm trying to make sure that I'm doing what's best and what's right with that, and I, I haven't followed your baby steps to a T always. And well, it's time to start, Jonathan. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, with, exactly. So that's where I want to make sure I'm starting this job. I'm going to get the paycheck the first month. I, I want to make sure that I'm doing this right from now on. Good. I have uh, $87,000 in student loan debt. Mm -hmm. And I have uh, $27,000 left on my car. Mm -hmm. uh, and otherwise, I have no debt. Mm hmm. I have eight thousand in savings. Um, after I pay this the rent at the first of the month, I, I have eleven and a half. But after I pay rent and everything at the first of the month, I'll, I'll have eight thousand dollars in savings. Mm -hmm. So I have step one. I need to build my way back to step three. Thank the Lord, I had it there during the layoff, mm -hmm. and um, I still have twenty four thousand in my Roth four hundred one k. Good. Good. And what's Should the I new salary? How much you're making? The now? new salary is one uh, one thirty. Wow. Are you married? I am not. Okay. Cool. Good for you. All right. So, one hundred fourteen thousand dollars in debt, eight thousand dollars in savings, and one hundred thirty thousand dollars income. Did I miss something? 
Nope. Okay. Well, it's it's simple and it's hard because you're used to having that cushion of an emergency fund while being very unsafe and insecure on the debt side. And so baby, you're in baby step two. You keep saying, I got to get back to baby step three. You were never there. We got a step in between that we just skipped. We just leapfrogged it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can't get to baby step three unless you've done two. That's kind of the, well, how the numer- nu- numerology thing works. So, um, yes. so, so here's My what we're going to do. We're going to attack the debts. Mm-hmm. And your car is your smallest one. And we're going to throw yeah, seven of your 8000 at that. And you're at baby step one, $1,000 saved. Now we're attacking, de- doing the debt snowball in baby step two, attacking with a vengeance. And we're going to, you know, do nothing, no eating out, no partying, no vacations, no spending well, I'm money. I'm tired of renting. Do what? I'm tired of renting. I don't I'm care. You renting. need to get this mess cleaned up. Okay. You're broke. That's why you're yeah. a renter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so let's not yeah. be broke anymore. Let's get this mess cleaned up. So you got $114,000. If you pay off uh, $65,000 a year, $70,000 a year mm-hmm. out of your one thirty, you're debt-free in two years. Zero debt at all. You'll have a paid-for car, and Sally Mae will have been evicted from your house. Mm-hmm. You'll have your life back. How old are you? I'm 30. Okay. I'm or you can wander along the next 10 years and be mediocre, Jonathan, and at 40, still be screwing around with a student loan debt like most people do. Or you mm-hmm. can punch the thing in the freaking face repeatedly until it dies. Mm-hmm. Time to get with it. Are those student mm-hmm. loans broken up into a bunch of little loans? Um, they consolidated, uh, but they're still like consolidated federally. And I think the average on that uh, interest rate is like 5.8%. Yeah. So no adding to your retirement, no life. For the next 18 to 24 months. And don't withdraw from your retirement either. Yeah. 18 to 24 months. It's game on. It's I am so pissed. I am getting this mess cleaned up. I felt very vulnerable and afraid when I got laid off and I had $114,000 in debt. So the next time something bad happens, not if, when something bad happens, I'll have no debt. Mm. It's a different feeling, dude. Yeah, but not having, I mean, I... Because I didn't attack my debt so hard, I had that three months, you know, safety cushion. So when the rain happened, I was okay. Yeah. I, I kind of want to have that. So, you know, I kind of don't care what you want. You're time. broke. Yeah. You call me. Dude, mm-hmm. do this stuff. I'm going to be mean to you. Do it. Come on. I'm your coach. It's halftime. All right. Okay. All okay. Right. Yeah. You, first, first half in, in the first half, quarter, first quarter, you, you got a little bit ahead. Second half, you got behind. And now you're coming in from the half, and it's time to get with it, and let's get this thing knocked out. You get a new lease on life. You got double your – You got. thank God you got laid off. You got double your income. And no, mm-hmm. listen, we're, I don't want you to stay with no emergency fund for long. The faster you get out of debt, the faster you're going to have a legitimate emergency fund. That's baby step three. But, but listen, this – millions of people have done what I'm asking you to do for you. Doesn't affect me, man. But listen, don't don't sit and argue with your personal trainer when he's got a six pack and you have a keg. Don't argue with your personal trainer. You called us. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. You can do it, man. I'm cheering you on. I'm not fussing at you. You can do this. Hang on. Here's the other part. The the student loan pause is really what saved him, and that's coming to an end. Uh, abrupt halt. And so those payments are coming back. And Ooh. so you lose another job, you owe uh, with many payments as $87,000 makes up. So next time that happens, you're not safe. And that emergency fund is going to get drained real quick if we don't get rid of these payments. They're mm-hmm. killing you, man. Yeah. It, it, it's your shortest distance to peace, financial peace. Two words that don't go together, like airline service. Okay. It's your shortest distance to peace and your shortest distance to wealth. The, 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 distant, the, the path we're giving you. Please, the lady just called right before you and said how how wonderfully it worked when she finally decided to work it. So here's that's tough. You, People that, go, well, Dave, I'm kind of doing your plan. And yeah, I got no debt except for a hundred thousand. I'm like, are you listening to yourself? Like, <laughs> did you just, just follow the just, plan? Just, if it doesn't work, come back play, and yell play at this us. back later and hear how it sounds. But yeah. you can't do half the plan and then get mad when you get half the results. Don't call us back. Well, like, you, your plan didn't pro- work. Here's the problem, George. You don't even get half the results. Because this thing doesn't, it's not linear like that. Mm. Doing half the plan gives you 10% of the results. It, it's, that's what the problem with ish is it's more damaging than, than it sounds because you feel like you're doing something yeah. ish, you know, but you're not really doing anything. It's like, you know, you're going it, to, it's like the people that do yo yo dieting. 
You know, you know what I'm talking about. They they lose weight and then they gain back, back more. Back and forth, back and forth. Then they lose weight and then they gain back more. And so the net five years later is is they weigh more than when they started considerably. Mm. And, and so uh, because they didn't change permanently the grooves in our brain when it comes to the, the dieting people always say lifestyle. You have to change your lifestyle. Well, that's what we're talking about. Paradigm shift, behavior, yeah. all of it. Yeah, the whole thing. So hang on, dude. We're going to send you a copy of the book, The Total Money Makeover. I want you to get a highlighter. I want there to be like hand grease on that book because you're looking at it all the time. Lots of sticky notes all through it. This is your guide. It is a proven plan. Ten million of these Total Money Makeover books out there. It didn't happen because it didn't work. Those sales happen because this crap works. I don't know how to do nothing else, but dude, I got this down. Hang on, we'll give you a copy of the book. This is The Ramsey Show. Camel Ramsey personality is my co-host. Thank you for joining us, America. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Hey, if you're a new listener and you want to dive deeper into the Ramsey baby steps, this whole Ramsey way of doing things, go to RamseySolutions.com. Click the Get Started button. Completely free. And we'll help you figure out what the next best step in your financial journey is is janelle is with us in spokane washington hi janelle welcome to the ramsey show hi dave hi george hi how can we help yeah so my question is in short how do i transit the personal baby steps to business but i'll give a little background i found you in 2016 paid off sixty thousand in consumer debt and then the mortgage and so we're on baby step seven personally. Mm-hmm. What that afforded us to do was for me to leave my government job and open my own business two years ago. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to figure out how much savings the business should have. You know, we keep those things separate. Mm-hmm. And is there ever a time when debt in business might, like we have a big project we need to do that would bring in more business. Mm-hmm. Do I just practice that same patience and wait until the business can pay cash for that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The, that's I what I do. I, we run Ramsey businesses with $300 million. Ramsey solutions with $300 million business this year. Uh, it started on a card table in my living room 32 years ago, and we've never borrowed a dime. And we've had a lot of big projects and big is always relative to where you are right then. Right. I mean, when you're on a card table in your living room, big is anything. But, um, you know, we're just uh, uh, we, we've sometimes we've just had to say no to things. But then we're always ready when something like a pandemic hits or when some other negative event occurs in business variables that we can't control. We've always got a pile of cash and no debt. And so we've never laid off a soul. We got over a thousand team members and we've never done a layoff, even in downturns, even when we have fluctuations in cash flow. Uh, we don't have to do we don't have to lose our greatest asset, which is our people. Um, and, and so we don't have to play corporate America games, which is treat people like they're dirt. And, um, so, you know, uh, because we've handled, done this with those principles. So all of that to say, um, you're always going to have a tension, uh, between the, there's always going to be a, uh, a, a shiny object in front of you. Yeah. And I just have to tell myself, don't be a bass. Because of, okay, it's easy on our personal side. That's so yeah, easy. Yeah, I know. To but, say. but a bass, no. you know, they jump on shiny objects, and you know what happens is they get hooked. And then they get reeled okay. in the boat and filleted, okay? So don't be a bass because sometimes the bee is silent, okay? And so. <laughs> You'll get that one. Tonight. Yeah. It'll come to me later. But um, yeah, that's what I, I have to tell myself that all the time because there's always something. When you're in business you're, and you're an entrepreneur, you're excited about the opportunities that are in front of you, and they all are good. They're not. 
But we always feel like they're good. All of our ideas, we think they're good, but they're not. And, you know, yeah. so what has happened is, is I've limited the size of my mistakes because I refuse to borrow in them. You will magnify the size of your mistakes in business when you borrow into them. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, it does. And then the other piece is as far as savings. Right now, I have our insurance deductible, which is $5,000 that mm -hmm. just sits there. And then I have four months expenses because it is a, a seasonal business so mm -hmm. far. My goal That's is good. to not touch that four months in the winter, but, good. but it's there. Should I have more than that? Yeah, I, I, maximum of six in, okay. re, in retained earnings. Six or Six months of expenses in retained earnings is plenty. I've never been able to achieve that. We don't have six months of retain in, of expenses and retained earnings today. Uh, yeah. That would be like bazillions of dollars, okay, today. But um, but but the, uh, uh, the the thing is, since I don't borrow money, I have to sit on cash. Yeah. Because cash covers the downturns and cash covers the opportunities to buy things to try a new project that might fail. Uh, I tried a project um, 18 months ago that we're still closing up right now that cost, cost us $3.2 million in losses. We lost $3.2 million. Um, I'm still kind of aching from that but because um, I love the idea. I still love the idea, but apparently it sucked. So, um, uh, But it was painful, really, really painful. And uh, I'm, I'm whining in front of everyone right now. But, um, but yeah, but that, at least it was cash, right? You imagine so if that I, was all I, I don't have to pay payments on my mistake for the next four years. It's, yeah. it's over except for the emotional scars and tears and and whining but yeah all that but yeah so that that's what you want to do six months covers your purchases it covers your new ideas and it covers your downturns it's called retained earnings it's not quite an emergency fund because it does more than just emergencies so it's a mm -hmm. little different in that regard and the baby steps really do not apply to business okay, okay. because the, the 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 principles that the baby steps are based on do apply to business. The Debt borrower, free, have money in the, the bank. The borrower slave to the lender, so we don't borrow money. Live on less than you make. A foolish man devours all he has. Always have savings, because in the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil. Spread your portions to seven, yes to eight, for disaster may come upon the land. Diversify, okay? These are biblical financial principles that are co common sense and grandma's ways of doing things. Be Always be generous. God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver. Be generous in your personal life. Be generous with your business. No one hates generous people. Well, that's probably not true, but they don't hate them for being generous. Uh, it's an attractive feature. I'm a generous person. People hate me, so they're, that, but not because of that. They hate me for other reasons that they made up in their own little minds. That's but, right. Yeah. Well, I want to help you with this. I'm going to gift you Dave's book, Entree Leadership, because this is the playbook that he's built this place on, and he's been doing it for 30 years now successfully. So we're going to send that to you. I also encourage you to check out the Entree Leadership podcast, which Dave hosts, and you'll hear some of these calls where people got themselves into a pickle because they thought, if I just go into debt, we'll have more money, and it'll all work out, and mm. then it doesn't work out. And business gives you more rationalization even than personal does because you think you're going to make money with the money that you go in debt with. I mean, so that's the ultimate rationalization. Mm. And, uh, you know, if I just if I just had this piece of equipment, you know, we could do it. You know, it doesn't feel it. frivolous. Yeah. You're yeah. not going on vacation or buying a yeah, new car. It's, it's, it's not, it's not get just a piece of equipment. It's not consumerism. It's actually investing, but it's still a bad idea. Still a bad idea, and you still get yourself in a pinch. Good question. Thanks for joining us, Janelle. Yeah, do check out the Entree Leadership Podcast. I'm enjoying. I just took it over, and uh, we fired George. That's right. In uh, in January, because George is such, he's such a big deal now. He ain't got time to do the Dead Gum Podcast, so I had to go do well, it. Well, they wanted so. me to do this YouTube channel. My like, guys, I already host 17 shows around here. We got to take one off. The There's point. only so much that George can do with his stardom. I'm a lot of man, but I'm only one man. <laughs> I've been told that <laughs> by nobody. <laughs> It's fine. I'm not even commenting. Okay. Open phones here at 888-825-5225. The Entree Leadership Podcast, by the way, is now caller-driven. So people like her call in to that show all the time, and we'd love to have you do that. And uh, thanks for joining us. And, by the way, you can come to the Entree Leadership events. There's, we have about 10,000 small businesses between the size of five team members and 200 team members that uh, interact with us in coaching. Uh, we have a digital product called Entree Leadership Elite where you can follow through the stages of business and the six drivers of business. Uh, people come to Entree Leadership Summit. Uh, the Entree Leadership Master Series will be here on campus this fall. There's about 75 tickets left to that, I think. it's only, We only allow about 750 coming into it um, because we keep that very small. It's very interactive. And um, 
I love working with small business people because, like Janelle, because they're the backbone of the American economy. Absolutely. And they inspire me. When I meet these men and women at these events, I'm going, these guys are rock stars. And they're running their businesses dead free. And so it's another reminder that you can do this differently than culture says to. Yeah. And let me just say, that was not a philosophical statement. That was a statistical statement. 54% of the gross domestic product in America, the economy, 54% is created by businesses with less than 500 team members, by definition, small wow. businesses. So small business literally, mathematically, is the backbone of the American economy. So, I mean, you know, whatever Dell does or whatever big company does is nice or whatever, that's fun, but it really is not the economy. It's mom and pops running heat and air companies and ice cream shops and that are running the local veterinarian clinic. They're the ones that Serving make the their communities. They're the ones that make the world go round, man. Mathematically, economically. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey, George Camel here. If you love the show and you want a deeper dive on your money journey, we've got a weekly newsletter that gives you helpful articles and tips on following the Ramsey way. Just go to RamseySolutions.com today to sign up for the newsletter. Again, that's RamseySolutions.com to sign up for our weekly newsletter. From the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the pods, moving, and storage studios, it's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. George Camel, host, co-host of the Smart Money Happy Hour, massively successful podcast, and the ever-popular, brand-new, exploding George Camel YouTube uh, station. I don't really call that a show. Yeah, I mean, you, you could hey, call it a show. It's, it's a all show. squishy in the YouTube world now, but now we're on Spotify, too. You can watch us on Spotify with their new Spotify video platform. Well, there you go. So we're no longer just a YouTube channel. Is this show on Spotify yeah. video, too? Yeah. Oh, hi, guys. I think so. Oh, just no, mine not is. Yet. No. Not yet. Not yet. We're oh. working on it with Randy. Hello show. in the future. Okay. I got there first, Dave, as I tend to do. You're, you're a cutting edge. Setting the trends. Cutting edge. Just like a razor. Just right on the edge. We're going to get you in skinny jeans next. More of a guinea pig than cutting edge. But if okay. you were to put me a guinea pig. Hashtag edge. hurtful. <laughs> hurt people, hurt people, James. <laughs> His third grade teacher was mean to him. But yeah, the, um, wow. It, he was homeschooled, so it's, it'd be his Ooh. mom. Both. Mrs. Childs, I'm a, she watches the show, so I know she just saw that burn happen live. <laughs> oh, ouch. All right, Julia's with us in Dallas. Hi, Julia, how are you? Hi, thank you for taking my call. Sure, what's um, up? Well, I'm retired, and I do not have a long-term care plan, and everyone says, you've got to have one. Mm -hmm. So I've been talking to several people and trying to find what's the best, mm -hmm. and I present it with a couple of them. And the one that sounds good, but it may be too good to be true, is um, what they're calling Asset Flex. It's a fixed premium universal life insurance. Yeah, with it's not reimbursed. good. No, it's horrible. Horrible. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. I just cut to the chase here. Yeah. No, okay. all, all you're doing is prepaying everything. That's all you're doing. How old are you? I'm almost 70. Okay. Um, so I'm really late into the game. Okay. And, and are, you in other, good are you in good health? I'm in good health. What, yes. what is your, uh, what's your nest egg look like? Um, about 700,000. Okay. And uh, are you married? No. Okay. And no children. Okay. Uh, the likelihood of you, if you were to self-insure at this stage, of you burning through your 700000 is almost zero. The average nursing home stay is two and a half years in America, okay? And the older you are, the more that average drops for obvious reasons, okay? So that includes from 60 years old on. So 70-year-old is probably less than two and a half uh, time, year average on average. Now, average nursing home is about... Uh, anywhere from 50 to 100K a year. 
So let's call this $250,000 as the average nursing home stay. If you buy a long-term care policy, it won't cover but three or four years. Right. Okay. And so, you know, the, the three or four years that it's covering is $250,000. I don't want you to lose $250,000, but you worked your whole life. You got $700,000. Way to go. You got to pay for a house, too? Yes. So you're, you're a millionaire then, I bet, right? Am I? <laughs> I don't know. What's your house worth? Um, about two hundred thousand. Okay, and you got seven hundred in the in the nest egg, so that's nine hundred. So you're pretty close. If you're not a millionaire, you're very close to being one. All right. Okay. A million dollar net worth, and so um, I, I, if I were in your shoes, and I'm talking to you, you're, you're telling me you're healthy. I'm going to self insure mm-hmm. through this. I'm not buying one of these products. I like long term care insurance. If you told me you had three hundred thousand dollars in total nest egg. Um, I'd tell you to let's talk about how to get long-term care insurance, but at your age, it's going to be expensive. And that's what mm-hmm. you're running into. You're running into seven, $8,000 a year premiums, aren't you? Well, the, the, uh, the universal plan. No, no, not that one. A year. That one's not got that a bunch one. of other costs built into it. Okay. Well, the other one that I was presented with was an indemnity, which, um, had a home care plan, which was running at like 2000 a year and a um, nursing home with an assisted living for about 1300 mm-hmm. and i could do one or both of them yeah okay. um, well, that that's still that that's a bare bones policy that's the other end of the spectrum so uh-huh. here's the thing what you'll probably find and and i don't know how you'll pull this off in, in your exact situation but uh I, i'm i'm getting ready to turn 63 sharon and i will self insure through our nursing home type needs because if something happens to Sharon with the amount of money that we have, 100% chance I'm going to do in-home care and hire somebody full-time to live in our house. Mm-hmm. I can afford it. And it's actually cheaper probably than a nursing home anyway and a higher quality yeah. care. And if I have to hire two and a butler, I will. <laughs> it's still gonna, I'm still going to – I still got the money, right? And I'm still okay. Right. It's one of the reasons right. I work is for quality of life. And so – I'm going to take care of Sharon. She's going to take care of me. And I don't have to be there personally doing every little thing. Like, uh, like if, if, you know, if someone's got advanced dementia or something and you need, you know, serious care, I can bring in serious care into my home. It's not that big a deal. I mean, we, we can buy a bed that elevates. I mean, it's not that big a thing. You, you know, they're just stuff. When you start talking about writing checks that are $100,000 a year, quickly you can start hiring a bunch of people, right? Yes. So uh, this is uh, this is our plan. We're self-insuring through it. Now, I will tell you, again, I'm a huge believer, once you're 60 years old, in spending three or $4,000 a year for someone that has a nest egg of under a half million dollars and, having, and, and just buying a straight long-term care policy. We believe in long-term care insurance. But once you've got a million-dollar net worth or greater and it's enough of it's liquid to do in-home care, the Ramseys will be doing in-home care. Mm-hmm. And my net worth is certainly larger than that, but um, not to brag. But the point is, it's not a thing. I mean, I spend more than that on a dadgum car, you know. So, I mean, it's just... Yeah, the point is, would it bankrupt you to have to cover the side of your own pocket? Well, what happens in a typical scenario is, let's say mom and dad have $300,000 saved, okay? And uh, typically, the normal scenario statistically is Papa goes into the nursing home and it stays there two and a half years and burns the... Cracks and scrambles the nest egg, burns the three hundred grand up, and dies. Mama's left, no money, and probably retired, unable to work, and mad at the nursing home. But they didn't do anything wrong. All they did was provide a service, and you paid them for it. They didn't do anything wrong. Nursing nursing homes aren't crooks. They do a fine. Most of them do a fine job. Uh, so, but in that case, seventy five percent of you ladies will outlive your husbands statistically. Now, I don't know exactly what all that means, but that's the actual number. Uh, we could have a lot of fun jokes with that. But anyway, Sharon has our full estate plan uh, based on me predeceasing her. I'll just tell I you that. I think Sharon's going to outlive me at this point. I'm, I'm thinking I have to sleep with one eye open with this woman. But yeah, the because um, she could off me and have a really good life. But the uh, uh, so <laughs> but the uh, uh, if you if ladies, if your husband outlives you and he burns through the nest egg in the nursing home bill because you only had 300 grand saved and you use all that, then you definitely, that's where you need long-term care insurance big time. You can't it, handle that risk. If you're in poverty level, you get welfare, Medicaid nursing home, okay, if you're in poverty. And if you're wealthy, you can provide it for yourself 
with self-insured. But that middle ground, baby, you need long-term care insurance once you're 60 years old. And statistically, it's less than one quarter of 1% of the people under 60 go into a nursing home. That's nobody. So don't buy this stuff until you're 60. You don't need it. It's, it's not there. The chances aren't there. So we love long-term care insurance in, the, in that particular window. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey, Dr. John Deloney here. I'm a huge fan of both meditation and prayer. And good mental health includes slowing down, gaining control of your thoughts, and plugging into something bigger than you. And Hallow makes it easy to start a daily practice of meditation, prayer, and finding peace. Hallow is the number one Bible app in the world, and you can tailor content towards your faith tradition. From scripture readings and prayers to meditation and journaling, Hallow makes it easy to practice prayer, meditate, and build a deeper, more meaningful spiritual life and rediscover true peace. Go to hallow.com slash Ramsey today to get three months of Hallow for free. That's hallow.com slash Ramsey. George Camel Ramsey, personality, host of the George Camel YouTube show and co-host of the Smart Money Happy Hour with Rachel Cruz. Both very popular Ramsey Network productions. Be sure and check them out on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever else you view or listen to great podcasts and shows. We're pretty much everywhere. We're uh, medium agnostic. We go with everybody. Wherever they'll take us, you we'll can, show up. You can find us there. Yep, wherever they'll take us. That's about right. So, adjustable rate mortgages making a comeback, according to Experian.com. Yeah, so I did this video on my YouTube channel about a week ago, and for some reason it just blew up. And people are very interested in this idea with mortgage interest rates being super high right now. And uh, we ha showed a stat there. In the very beginning, at you know January of 2022, it was like three percent. By May of 2022, it was ten percent. So we've been seeing the spike in adjustable rate mortgages, and I wanted like to get your take 10%. on ten percent. Uh, How many mortgage rates are ten percent? Well, no, the actual the amount of people doing them. Oh, three percent the of the mortgages. The amount of people doing adjustable three. rate mortgages has gone way up. Yes. I got you. Okay. Yeah, not the interest rate itself. Okay. So I wanted to cover this, and I just watched your real estate lesson, Financial Peace University, where you cover a lot of these mortgage traps. But a lot of people are going. This might be my ticket to home ownership, Dave. And this article unpacks what's going on here. It's your ticket to foreclosure. Yeah. Arms have started to recover more from more than a decade of disinterest from both consumers and lenders. They're returning to the fold amid a sharp increase in home prices and fixed mortgage rates that began in early 2022. As the housing market begins to thaw from a year of depressed demand, more potential sellers begin to list their homes. Could arms help more prospective buyers get a foot in the door of their first home? Wait a minute. You don't understand. This, this passive-aggressive question statement here is on Experian. Which is a com. this would be the credit, credit bureau. bureau. Yeah. Who, what, is, what is their vested interest in this? <laughs> Getting you in debt and keeping you in debt because you're all worried about their FICO score. Hello. They'll make money if you get a mortgage and they have to run the score. This is a yeah, money making scheme for this them. Is a, yeah, we love debt. And so we're experienced and we're going to passively aggressively ask is this a way for people to get their foot in the door? That sounded very soft. Sounded like a suggestion to me. Sounded like a conspiracy to me. Here's, oh, they have a new stat in here, Dave. The share uh, increased from 3%. It was for much of the decade to as high as 13% by October of Of the mortgages. Of the mortgage originations. That are going out there. 3% used to be adjusted. So 97% were not doing adjustables, and now 87% are and not And it's doing down it. as of April 2023. They say it's now 8% of all new mortgages. Yeah, thank so. God. It's right. taking a dip. So do we need to talk about this? Well, I want you to just share why they're a bad idea, because people don't understand. And there, there's a funny clip from The Office with Michael Scott falling for one of these. And he's like, well, no, it's a 30. And she's like, no, it's 10 over. And so I wanted you just to run the analysis on who is this for? Why are people doing this? Why should they stay away? Okay. Um, we'll get real technical to help you. But before we do that, let's just say this. All right. If you buy a mortgage 
that adjusts in an increasing interest rate environment, what are you expecting it to adjust to? Up. Well, that's dumber than a rock on the surface. Interest rates are moving up, and you're buying a mortgage that allows them to in and gives you the probability of a higher interest rate later. Let's just start with that stupid. Okay? The second thing is this. Let's say interest rates stay the same or go down slightly. Here's what you're going to discover. Your mortgage interest on your adjustable rate mortgage is going to go up even if rates go down a little or stay the same. Here's why. Your mortgage is adjusted based on an index and a spread over the index. Let's just do a simplified version, okay? Let's say you took out a 4% adjustable rate mortgage, and it's supposed to be 2% over the index. That would mean the index would be 2. 2 plus 2 is 4, okay? And, and if the, But the index, however, when you start your brand new mortgage, they move you in on a bait and switch because the index is already higher would, would, it would, would give you the spread, would already give you a higher interest rate today than you're getting today. So instead of the more, okay, let's say we're getting a 4% adjustable rate, the index is 2, your spread is 2, so that 2 plus 2 equals 4, okay? But it's not 2. The index today in that case would be more like 2.6. Mm. So the interest rates would have to go down 0.6 for your rate to remain the same the next time it adjusts. Y'all follow how I'm doing this, okay? Because the index plus your spread equals your interest rate. And the index is already cheated up when you go in, so rates would have to go down in order for you to do this. And So it's a big gamble. So It's not a big gamble. Well, the You're lenders- 100% dead on going to have an increase. There's no gamble about it. You 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 know, and you bought the house on short term thinking. Thank God it's Friday. Oh God, it's money. I can pay this payment. Like this payment's even going to be around on the first adjust. You're going to see an increase. It's not a gamble. Almost a hundred percent of the time, because again, rates would have to go down to get your spread to keep your spread on the index far enough down. Okay, yeah. it just doesn't work. So this all came from. Mortgage companies protecting themselves in 1982. I was selling real estate. The first adjustable rates came out then, okay, because interest rates had gone to 17%. Remember that? And more and money market rates. Back then, we had these things called savings and loans. Money market rates on your savings were 12%. You could get 12% on your savings account. Well, let me help you with this. The local savings and loan makes a loan in the 70s on a mortgage, 4%. They are receiving 4% on $100,000. Interest rates shoot up. That's a 4% fixed rate loan. Now, in order to get $100,000 into the savings and loan or into the bank, they got to pay out 12, Mm. but they're only receiving four. That's a problem. That's called in the banking world. They call that disintermediation. Your your butts upside down mathematically, and so that's one of the things called the savings and loan industry to crash. That's why I brought up savings and loans. It's one of the things that crashed them was disintermediation. It wasn't fraud. It was that because they had uh, millions of dollars of mortgages on the books at a fixed rate, and all of a sudden they're having to pay more than they're receiving to get new savings deposits. So they said to themselves, "Self, I don't like this." Next time these rates go up, we're going to have a portion of our portfolio that adjusts up as interest rates go up. And so the adjustable rate mortgage was born so that to protect the banks against an increasing interest rate environment so they don't get stuck with a bunch of low interest mortgages on the books. Ta-da. The first, in, the first adjustable rate mortgage I sold was the fixed rates were 14%, 1982, 1983. The fixed rates were 14%. Our adjustables were 12. Wow. And I said, man, nobody will ever buy these things. And that was 1982, and they're still buying them. Still around today. So just, just transferring the risk from the lender onto you. It's all 100% it is. what it does. It transfers the, the risk of higher interest rates from the lender. It inc- ensures that the lender is always going to freaking make money. 
or it amounts to. This is a bank play. It ain't got anything to do with being a blessing to you and allowing, according to experience, help prospective buyers get their foot in the door. Bull crap. Hadn't got anything to do with prospective buyers. It's got to do with banks. And one thing you can count on on banks is banks protecting banks. It's what they do. And they've been good at it for a long time. That's why their furniture is nicer than yours. That's why their building is bigger than yours. It's not an accident. Santa Claus didn't build those freaking towers in the skyline. It was you. You built them with this kind of crap where you give these banks your money. You mm-hmm. fall for the trap of this stuff. So adjustable rate mortgages is it's one of the biggest ripoffs ever to come along, especially because of the motivation of it. Yeah. To come it's along and everything. So don't, if, you, if you have to do an adjustable rate mortgage, it means you can't afford the house. That's what it means. Don't buy that house. Listen, if you don't want your feelings hurt, go watch the YouTube version that I did called The Sneaky Mortgage Trap People Keep Falling For. I'm nicer than Dave in the video. I will say that much. George, that's 100% true always. And James Child, you're producer, nicer than Dave. he plays the guitar in the video. So that's one more reason to go check it out. Well, there's just a lot of entertainment value. That's I'm all saying. I can bring. Nice people with guitars. Okay. Leave the grouch alone. This is The Ramsey Show. Well, you've all played the telephone game. The first person whispers a message to the second person who whispers it to the third and so on around the table until the original message has completely changed. Multiply that confusion by 100 if you run a business with different software systems that don't talk to each other. That's why there's NetSuite by Oracle. In the early days of Ramsey, we were using different systems for all of our business units. We needed one single source for accurate data. NetSuite was the software we used to optimize and take us to the next level. NetSuite gave us the visibility into all of our numbers so that we could communicate across departments and plan ahead better. And as we grew, it scaled with us. NetSuite worked for Ramsey, and it will make a difference for your business too. Join the more than 34,000 customers who trust NetSuite to help make them smarter and make better decisions and level up their operations. To learn more, get a free product tour at netsuite.com slash Ramsey. That's netsuite.com slash Ramsey. In the lobby of Ramsey Solutions on the debt-free stage, Alec is with us. Hey, Alec, how are you? Hey, guys. How's it going? Better than we deserve. Where do you live? Uh, Well, I live in Los Angeles right now, but I will be moving over here to Franklin next week. Oh, wow. Getting ready to be neighbors then. Yes, sir. Right next to you. Very cool. Love it. So uh, how much debt have you paid off, Alec? Uh, I'd be $73,636. Love it. And how long did that take? About two and a half years. All right. Very good. And your range of income during that time? So I started out at 89 and closed out at about 130. Cool. Good for you. Love it. So what kind of debt was the 74,000? Well, it was a combination of a few things. Um, I had student loans, which was probably about 53. And then I had a car loan, which was about 19. And then the rest was phones. So I oh, okay. had a couple of phones, but all right. Cool. Good deal. I love it. So um, good stuff. Now, what got you started on this two and a half years ago? Um, well, it actually started a little bit earlier than that. My mom had got me uh, the Total Money Makeover book for Christmas. And uh, she goes, hey, you know, I think you should get on this and you know, start working on it. So I said, uh, you know, all right, I'll get around to it. And then um, COVID kind of hit. And uh, I started. Kinda. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, COVID hit. And um, I started doing Postmates. Um, and then I kept doing that, kept doing that, and I'd racked up probably like about $6,000. And uh, I was looking at my car one day, and I knew that I had the car note, 
And I basically told myself that either, you know, I could put this in some investments or I could just really start on this. And I took that 6,000 that day, put it towards my car loan oh. and just kept on going. So I got it started. Yes, it did. You saw the number go down. You were like, this works. Yeah, I can do this. Like, I, can, I can own this. Wow. And this I was in it. L.A.? Yes, during COVID. LA, during COVID. What a brave soul you were. I know. Out on the was... I Am Legend streets delivering yeah. food to people. Oh, my gosh. I did some things I'm not proud of driving through those streets, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was done. <laughs> wow. I do miss the lack of traffic. Oh, <laughs> my, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't miss the reason for it, but I miss the lack of traffic. Wow. Oh, what caused cool. your income to jump? What do you do for work? Well, I work in construction, and um, I started out with a contractor out in L.A., and then uh, I you know, wanted to switch it up, wanted to go on a different path for my career, took a job with another uh, contractor. And um, obviously, you know, that jumped my income. Uh, but the big thing I did want to say was, you know, I t decided to leave that company and um, come out here because, mm -hmm. you know, I was just getting tired of LA. And uh, for all the people that are listening, you know, if you think, you know, oh, I come out here to Tennessee, you know, I'm going to take a, a pay jump because of taxes. Number one, that's true. But um, my salary actually didn't change. So wow. I'm still making the same I made in L.A. out here. With, Plus, no, with no taxes. With no taxes. So I got a pay jump. So there you go. incredible. Just yeah. like that. Yep. Just like that. Well done. So it can be done. Yeah, good for you. All right. So what do you tell people the key to getting out of debt is? Uh, well, I jotted a couple things down. But, um, you know, I wanted to keep it short and simple. But, you know, I was young when I got started. You know, I'm 27 now, so I got started probably, you know, around when I was 25, uh, 24. But, uh, you know, start when you're young. If you get on this plan that Dave has got out there, you know, we got the baby steps and everything. It's laid out right there for you. But uh, I'll say, you know, if you start when you're young, you can get ahead of yourself and you can continue on that path to hopefully build more wealth as time goes on. Um, but the big thing is, is, you know, you got to want it. When you're going out with your friends, you're out at the bar, you know, and everybody's like, hey, you going to lay your card down so we can get some shots? Nope, I'm not. Um, but, you know, like that came up a couple times for me. So uh, <laughs> That was not a uh, metaphor. Yeah. specific. It was yeah. a real that, story. That's a tough one because people feel like, well, I'm going to miss out on my social life in my prime years in my 20s. And you went, hey, I could sacrifice for two years and then Apparently have a way Apparently the bunch he's running with is not going to remember it anyway. Yeah, they have no recollection of this experience. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. I, again, that's, I won't go into it. But, you know, you can you can definitely still have fun. I will say that. My, yeah. my, uh, oh, my roommate sure. told me, you know, you got to live your life, um, you know, you just have to live within your means. Um, I definitely live below your means, like yeah. you mentioned, Dave. But yeah. now you're really living with no payments. I know it. I how, mean, how does it feel to be free? Oh my gosh, it's just so uh, freeing, you know, mm -hmm. but um, relieving at the same time. You know, now I can go in. I got, you know, my lovely fiance over here. All right. Yeah. Good and, news uh, on the horizon. There's yeah. one reason to get your act together. I know. Right yeah. Her parents were looking at me like, man, you know, you better get this stuff going. You know, we, uh, <laughs> yeah. But um, so they're proud. Your mom's proud. Oh, everybody's man. proud. You got to feel good. I feel great. You yeah. know, I feel really privileged to be here with you guys. Well, but, we're honored to have you. You're, yeah. you're a hero, man. You took control of your life. And you did it at 24 years old. That's pretty impressive. That's yeah. very cool. Good for you. Good for you. Because you got the rest of your life now to live with common sense as your as your, uh, si as your side mate there. Well done. And oh, yeah. a great fiancé to go. That's awesome. Very cool. When are you getting married? Have you decided? Uh, well, like that last caller, you know, it's still, uh, well, obviously we're, you know, engaged. But I think probably about two years mm -hmm. is what okay. we're thinking. There's a lot of uh, weddings next year. So She just agreed with that. Okay. Well, she her. told me that. So. Oh, okay. Well, you are already got good that man. part figured yep. out. I okay, good. <laughs> good. That's a good start right there. That's good fine. stuff. So well done, sir. Very, very well done. What did you do? Did you work in any extra? I mean, did you do anything other than just the construction? Or Well, as I said, yeah, just the, the Postmates is what I did. That got me started in the oh, beginning. Oh, okay. You but, kept doing that. Yeah, but um, it was really just, you know, saving money where I could uh, with, with my income working in construction. So. Okay. There's Very two good. ways to get that margin. Spend less and make more. You did a little bit of both, and you went, oh, my gosh, I got some money left over to throw at the debt now. Oh, yeah. Oh, There's yeah. no life hacks there. No, none, just none at work. all, George. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well done, sir. Proud of you. Good, good work. Very cool. Very cool. Hey, we've got the uh, Live and Give box for you. It includes the Baby Steps Millionaires book. It includes the Total Money Makeover book and a Financial Peace University membership. Any of those that you haven't read or done, do them and give the rest of it away. It's a Live and Give bundle. So uh, thanks for coming all the way out here and welcome to the community as a, as a new uh, as a new neighbor. Very Tennessee. cool stuff. All right, it's Alec temporarily from Los Angeles. $74,000 paid off in two and a half years, making 89 to 130. Count it down. Let's hear a debt free scream. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. I'm debt free. Yeah. That's how that's done. Boom. Wow. Gotta love it. You gotta love it. You know, it is always interesting to me, George, that um, I, I don't know what the percentage is. I don't know if we've ever actually done the number, but I'll anecdotally say it's in the 90% plus range of the debt-free screams. During the time they're getting out of debt, have an increase in income. Sometimes it's a temporary increase because they pick up extra jobs. Sometimes it's just they're looking around and going, if I lived over there... I wouldn't have any taxes, you know. If I lived over there, I'd have that, you know. And so they, they get an increase in income because they're paying attention. Uh, too many times, too, if one part of our life is on uh, coast mode, you know, we're just sliding along, then another part of our life. So in other words, if we're letting our, we're half butt paying attention to our money, we may be half butt paying attention to our career. And when you start looking at, I need to get out of this debt. Well, how do I do that? Well, I ought to have some more money. Then you start looking at your career going, I don't make enough. This is crazy. I got to change something. Yeah, well, i They change this. jobs. They change careers. They add extra jobs. And we see income go up when people start paying attention. Well, and a lot of people in their 20s, they just feel like they're kind of a victim to the career culture. And they're a passenger in this car that they have no effect on their income. But once they believe they can pay off debt, they also believe, I can go make more money. Mm-hmm. And that's the most inspiring thing is, you know, people like Alec realize, oh, hope is a choice just as much as cynicism is, is a choice. Hmm. I can wait on the government. I can complain. Inflation, the housing market and wages have they haven't gone up as fast as inflation and it's everyone else's fault. And Alec just went, yep, and I'm going to do something about it. Hmm. And that is the key indicator I found between the YouTube commenters and the Alex of the world. And so that's a great reminder for everyone out there. Cynicism is a choice. Hope is a choice. You get to choose. Oh, you mean the negative commenters? Yes. Okay. Some of them are kind. But yeah. those are the generic YouTube comments going, this guy's out of touch. Nobody can do this. Alec did it. He's just like you. Yeah. And we're so weird. We talk to people every day that do it. And if we don't, we talk somebody into doing it. That's right. This is The Ramsey Show. personality is my co-host today thank you for joining us america matt is with us in detroit hey matt welcome to the ramsey show hey everyone how's it going better than we deserve what's up excellent so i uh i called the show i think maybe a week or two ago and i spoke with george and dave or uh, george and jade and i gave my situation and the recommendation was to pay off my house and pay off my my car with the remaining balance so that we had in our savings and my wife and I decided to do that. And honestly, there's a gigantic weight lifted off our sh shoulders. We're completely debt-free. Wow. And, Way um, to go. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that call, uh, George. I have, I had it's coming back to we're, me. We were thinking about upgrading our house, and but we didn't really need to right now. We're kind of in that sweet spot. It's, it feels like it's getting a little bit smaller on us, but I think we still have some time. So we decided to just pay off our house, pay off our car. We're completely debt-free right now. Incredible. I know it's it's amazing. It feels so great, honestly. Uh, everyone that I've listened to, especially from you guys, you always say it's just you'll be able to sleep in. I have never slept better, well, as best as I can with uh, two boys at home. <laughs> but 
<laughs> my next question is, or my question is now, where do I go from here? So we're thinking about w- looking into financial planners. And I guess my question is, what are some good questions to ask them? And how do I find one that's going to work for me and not, you know, just work for a paycheck, basically? And, you know, someone that has my best interest in mind. Good for you. Well, um, the, the one you can count on always having your best interest in mind is you. So uh, never acquiesce your decision-making to someone else. So your financial planners, uh, a percentage of them, I don't know, maybe 80% are salespeople. That is not what you want. The other percentage are teachers. They have the heart of a teacher. The teacher gives you the information and assumes you're a grown-up and you get to make your own decisions with your own money. They're going to teach you something. You're going to learn. You're going to feel equipped to make your own decision. Not, I did this because my guy said to do it, and I have no freaking idea what I just did, which is how athletes lose all their money, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So you need a, someone, the main thing you want is someone with the heart of a teacher. The second thing you want is someone whose values align with what you believe to be true about the world. For instance, you have just discovered that debt-free is awesome. If you walked in and sat down with a financial planner and they say, oh, no, you should go take out a $400,000 mortgage and use that money to invest with me. If that doesn't make you run out of there with your hair on fire, something's wrong with you. Absolutely. Yeah. And that we have something scheduled. So that, that's kind of what I had in mind. We, my wife and I have specific goals and plans, especially with saving for the kids. So that's exactly what I was. I was they need to, to execute your those. plan, not give you theirs. Absolutely. That's, that's really, yeah. really good. And advice. if you want people that do this stuff, the way we teach, we call them smart vester pros. There are thousands of them around the nation that we have vetted, and they have the heart of a teacher, and they believe and have the same values that we teach here on the air. You can find one of those, a SmartVestor Pro, by clicking SmartVestor at uh, RamseySolutions.com. It'll drop down a drop-down box, and you can pick from one or all of the ones on the drop-down box and go and interview them and find one that fits you and your personality best. Yeah, and the other thing to think about here, it's it's not just about a lot of people go, well, if it's just choosing funds, then I can go figure that out on my own and do DIY. But when you think about the value of financial advisor, and Vanguard's even done studies on this to show that the average investor doing it on their own, they don't make as much as those working with a pro. The ones working with a pro are making 3% more over the lifetime. And so you want to think about tax planning, estate planning, kind of that big high level financial plan, not just the 529 plan. Yeah. Hey, congratulations, Matt. That's We're awesome. so happy for you. Good That's job, George. That's a great George. place to be. I don't, you never know if people actually take the advice we give, and so it's just good That's to know. That's true. Sometimes, well, sometimes we know they're not going to. Yeah, but Matt, I could tell. Reacted, he was yeah. like, okay, I'm listening. And yeah. so I appreciate and that, Matt, and I'm he proud went, of you. He went and did it. And, you know, back to that Vanguard study, one of the other reasons we find that um, people make more with a financial advisor is simply because they don't jump in and out of the market based on emotion. And try to, time, they try to time the market. I'm going to get in because it's going up. I'm going to get out because it's going down. No, you just stay in. And part of a good advisor's job is talk you off the ledge and keep you invested. Don't stop investing and don't cash in and try to jump in, jump out. And I'm going to time the market. There's tons of research that shows that market timing doesn't work. Mm. It doesn't keep up with simply staying invested. Those on a roller coaster ride that don't jump off in the middle of the ride do not get hurt ride the sucker, ride it down, whee, and then ride it up. Click, 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 click. Enjoy the whole thing. It's part of the deal. So that's what you want to do in, in this thing. And, you know, getting a, an advisor in your corner is a big deal. Elijah's in Connecticut. Hey, Elijah, what's up? Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What's up? How can we help? Um, so I got a little bit of good news, a little bit of bad news. So, uh, good news is, uh, my wife and I are expecting baby number three. Yay! And, uh, yeah, pretty exciting. And bad news is, uh, we're outgrowing our house. Um, so we're kind of thinking of what the next step is for us. Um, so we're looking at a couple options. One is obviously selling and buying a new house. Mm-hmm. Um, the second one is probably renting this house and buying a new one. No. And the third one we're really taking a close look at is um, remodeling. Uh, this would allow us to basically convert our renovated attic into a full floor uh, mm-hmm. that would add two bedrooms and a bathroom. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So, yeah, I just wanted to get some input uh, in terms of that. I can give you some, um, you know, background in terms of our finances, too. If that helps. Are you out of debt? Uh, yeah, everything besides our mortgage. Uh, so okay. I would move today. I would sell your house you and move. move. Okay. All right. Yeah, a lot, a lot a of reasons. A, a lot know, of reasons for that. Quality of life during a remodel is horrible, and you got a pregnant wife or a brand new baby. You're talking about doing this with? No, thank you. I don't want right. to do a remodel in that. Second thing is, is you're probably I didn't even ask you the numbers yet, but you're probably getting ready to overbuild the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a house that's too expensive for that neighborhood. You'll never get your money out. And so uh, you're, trying to, you're trying to force a square peg into a round hole. How big is How many square feet is the house you're in? Uh, it's about 1,700. Yeah. Okay. And the average square footage of the house on your street is what? Uh, Are they all about that size? Good question. Yeah, I mean, a little bigger, I'd say. No, yeah, two? I don't think it would be out of place if we added a second floor. Okay. You don't think you would overbuild the neighborhood? No, no, no. Yeah. Actually, like, there's a lot of new construction in What's, the street. What, well, new construction doesn't count. What's that call? Unless your house is, like, three years old. Right, right. So yeah. um, the cost of renovating would probably be close to 200000 Oh, move. Uh, For God's sakes, move. <laughs> it's easier to yeah, build a we, house than do a $200,000 re renovation. Yeah. What's your house the worth? The only thing kind of keeping us back. Net worth? What's the house worth? Oh, the house. Um, about 450000 We owe about 180 on it. So you're saying neighbor, houses in that neighborhood go from four fifty to six fifty? Bull crap. No, they don't. Yeah, I mean, further down the street, they're like, you know. You're stretching, like man. To the beach. People don't drive on your street looking for $650,000 houses. <laughs> you're stretching. Yeah. You're building, okay. you're overbuilding the neighborhood. I promise you, I've been doing this my whole life. Real estate's my thing, man. No, you're getting ready to screw this up. And I got to tell you, you have no idea the hell you're getting ready to embrace with a $200,000 rehab. It's going to take more time and even more money than you thought with it's more just, problems. It's an easier to push the whole dad blame thing down and start over. My God, it really is. It's just a whole, it's a whole lot easier to build a house than do a rehab that size. Oh, man, no. I, and, and little babies already, and this is the third one coming in? No, thank you. Have a quality of life. Don't You know how much emotional bandwidth you're going to invest in this crap by the time you're done in the middle of having a baby? No, 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 no. You, know, you, you shouldn't build a house this year either, by the way. Same thing. Emotional bandwidth. Now, just go buy you a nice house for $650,000 or less where the payment is no more than a fourth of your take-home pay on a 15-year fixed and make your move up, please. Yeah, roll all the equity into the next one. Sell that one you're in. Don't try to stay in. Don't become a landlord by default with a bunch of debt. Just keep it real simple and real clean. Man, your life is just going to be so much better. Oh, you don't have the hassle. Oh, man. No, thank you. This is The Ramsey Show. Dave here. You can find all of our shows with the Ramsey Network app on your smartphone. It's the only place to listen to the entire back catalog of episodes. Download the Ramsey Network app in your favorite app store today. From the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the pods, moving, and storage studios, it's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. George Camel, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. This hour is a Baby Steps Millionaires theme hour. 
For those of you that are new to us, that means we're going to talk only to millionaires this hour. The phone number is 888-825-5225. If you're a millionaire, we want to get some of the details on your life and your story so that other people can hear how to do what you have done. See, there's a lot of people out there with opinions about wealth that don't have any wealth. They got lots of opinions. They got no money. And if broke people are giving you their opinion on money, that's kind of dumb if you're listening anyway. And so you don't want to do that. You want to talk to real people. And I don't really care about your broke brother-in-law who votes wrong. I don't, I don't need his opinion. I just, you know, I, it's okay. on money. I mean, if you want to talk to him about something else, that's fine. I'm not mad at him, but I'm not going to do this. So here, let's start with the basic definition of what a millionaire is, George. A millionaire is not someone that makes a million dollars a year. Thank you for clearing that up. That's a misconception a lot of people have. Yeah. And a millionaire is not someone that has a million dollars cash. That's a cash millionaire. Yeah. So not a net worth. This is not, it's like the word recession. There is a technical definition for it and you don't get to make it up. Well, I think we're in a recession. I don't care what you think. A recession is two consecutive quarters of a shrinking GDP. Period. It's an economic definition. It's not a political term, and you don't get to decide if we're in one or not. All you can do is observe the actual numbers. You don't get to decide if you're a millionaire. You don't get to de- redefine millionaire to fit your little political agenda and your equal, your uh, wealth equality, communism, Marxism crap. So here, here's what you get. Here's what a millionaire is. It is when someone has a net worth of $1 million or greater. Period. That's it. There's not another definition. Well, he's a net worth millionaire. That's the only kind of millionaires there is. It's not. It's redundant. It's redundant. It's like he's a millionaire millionaire. Okay. That's what you just said. All right. So a millionaire is someone whose assets minus their liabilities equals a million dollars or greater. What you own minus what you owe equals a million dollars. Well, you can't count real estate. Yes, you can. It's an asset. Stupid. That's the one I get the most. Real estate. In the YouTube comments, Dave, when I tell people, I walk them through how to do this, they go, you can't count your house. You can't even count your retirement accounts because you can't live off of that right now. That's I'm just going, dumb. You, can, you oh can't count it if you want to do a risk analysis, a, a liquidity analysis. But to, to determine if you're a millionaire, there's only one method. Assets minus liabilities equals a million dollars or greater. So that's who we want to talk to. And we want to find out how... You did it. We're going to start with Craig in Milwaukee. Craig, what's your net worth? Just shy of one point seven million. Love it. Okay, give me a little breakdown by category on that. How much of retirement? How much is house and so on? Um, just about seven hundred thousand in retirement and five twenty nine accounts. Mm-hmm. Uh, about five hundred and fifty thousand in um, a mix of uh, cash and other investments, ETFs, stocks, T bills, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. saving bonds, even even a little precious metals, mm-hmm. and um, and then uh, about four hundred and fifty thousand in real estate, which is made up of our primary residence. Got it. How old are you? I'm fifty one. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife is forty five. Cool. And how much of this one point seven million did you inherit? Zero. Zero. Okay. And what was your in your working lifetime? What was your work best year working income and your worst year working income? Oh, I would say the best year was uh, just a touch over two hundred thousand, and the worst was um, maybe seventy, eighty thousand. Okay. And what do you do for a living, or did you do for a living? Uh, I, um, I'm a lawyer and I have my own practice. Mm-hmm. Okay. So obviously you have a law degree. All right. What was your GPA? Yeah. Uh, in law school, it was, uh, just about 3.0. Okay. Good for you. Cool. So, uh, if you're talking to the younger version of yourself, 25 years ago in their twenties, can a young lawyer still become a millionaire? Yes. What would they do? What would you tell them to do? Well, I, I think uh, I, I would recommend, you know, take the time to to know yourself. And, um, you know, if you're, you're going to get married, uh, choose a spouse who shares your views. 
on money and finance, among other things, uh, because in my experience, uh, that became very, very critically important. And, uh, you know, not to go off on a tangent, but we, we, uh, we were introduced to, to, you know, your money management concepts very early in our marriage, and we really took to them, and we paid off um, student loan debt. We saved for a house but we took on a huge mortgage and um, ultimately became unhappy with our lifestyle, felt like we strayed from uh, the money management principles that, that you teach and that we were following. And so we decided to make a radical change and sold our house and moved to where we currently live. And, and now we're, we're living the exact life we want to live. Um, and if my, my wife wasn't on the same page with me about that, that could be very, challenging. So I would recommend that. And other than that, I think very standard things that you hear all the time, uh, live beneath your means. Uh, I would say be resourceful, uh, and, uh, be content with what you've got now and Mm. be patient because tomorrow, um, typically tomorrow is a better day. And in the long term, it's going to be much, much better. A lot of wisdom there, Craig. I'm curious, what car are you driving right now as a net worth millionaire? Right now, I drive a 2008 Honda Pilot. Wow. What's she drive? She drives a 2019 uh, Volkswagen Atlas. Good man. She's got the nicer car. <laughs> Federal law. Wife gets the good car. Yeah. Every once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I love it. Well, congratulations, sir. You're a hero. I'm proud of you. You went out there and did something that most lawyers don't do. However, I will tell you that in the largest study of millionaires ever done in North America, done by Ramsey Research Team, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we had the top five career fields, number five, that, that most often became millionaires. Number five was lawyer. Wow. And when yeah. the average age, I believe, was 51. Yeah. This guy's he's like a case study. And they drove Honda and Toyota and, and, as the you top know, cars. About a third of his net worth is his real estate. He's and a poster so child. It's, it's a, just exactly a case study. He's like a, a template of the uh, averages uh, of that study. We studied over 10,167 millionaires. So the conclusions we came to in that study are what's known as facts. So if you disagree with them, you're what's known as wrong. That's how that works, okay? We'll help you with this. It's a millionaire, a Baby Steps Millionaire's theme hour. We put all of this together in the book, The Baby Steps Millionaire, and it became a number one bestseller. So uh, be sure and check that out as well. George Campbell is with us. We'll be talking to real millionaires. Call us if you're one. The number is 888-825-5225. It's a competitive home buying market, but there's a way you can get an edge. Churchill Mortgage works with you to understand your budget and your goals. And the Churchill Mortgage Home Buyer Edge offers you fast pre approval and a secured interest rate. Plus, Churchill has bumped up their seller guarantee to $10,000, giving your offer the best chance of being accepted and helping you win in today's market. Go to churchillmortgage.com today to learn more. Baby Steps Millionaire's Theme Hour. George Camel, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. We started doing this theme hour on millionaires several years ago. It led us to do a study of millionaires. And uh, the white paper of that study is in the back of the, uh, if you want the detail, the nerdy research parts of it, it's in the back of the book, uh, the Baby Steps Millionaire's book. You can find it there. Um, but we started doing this show because I kept running into millionaires. And they weren't what everyone said they were because I didn't grow up with money. I grew up regular guy, just like George, you know, regular guy. And, you know, I 
just because I became a millionaire, I thought, well, maybe some of the, you know, because here's the things people say about millionaires, okay? They say stuff like, well, they all inherited their wealth. You can't be a millionaire if you don't have a rich uncle, right? Uh, they always say that, you know, millionaires are, the only way to get money is to be a crook. So you must have stolen. They did something wrong. You can't get that rich without doing something wrong, right? Or they, the other perception is, is that all millionaires, all wealthy people, you have to be famous. You know, you have to be like a country music star, a rock star, a, a, a professional athlete, a Hollywood actor. Uh, and the other thing they think is that they're, uh, okay, I can't be a millionaire because I'm not brilliant. I'm not a 4.0, 4.2 GPA guy. Or an investing guru. I'm not, I don't have this, I don't have this special sauce. I'm just a regular guy, regular gal. And that's the four biggest mythologies that are out there. And what we found with the study was, and we first found it when we're just talking to millionaires here on the air, is that all four of those are lies. None of them are true. Very seldom do crooks become millionaires. Let me help you with this. Because when crooks rip, rip, rip somebody off, you know what people do? They tell everybody. And nobody does business with a crook anymore. I mean, if you go to a, you know, I'll tell you who a lot of millionaires are. They own auto repair stores. A lot of millionaires have auto repair stores. And uh, you think they're just somebody who turns a wrench, but I just tell you, they got more money than you got. And so, um, so, but if you go in there, that guy's store, and he rips you off, I'm repairing your car, you know, he puts in a, he claims to fix it, charges you a thousand dollars, and you drive off, and it's still doing it, right? Still got a problem. You come back, and he goes, "Well, I just, you know, it's the way it is," and you know, whatever. It was an it was an analysis fee, and well, what do you do? You tell everybody that guy that guy's a crook. You're going on Yelp, Google reviews, the neighborhood you go Facebook over that page. Same, yeah, you go exactly. You go over that same auto repair guy, and he says, "You go in there, and he he does three things, and he comes out, and you go, if he says, I got it fixed, it's no problem.' You go, what do you what do I owe you?'" Nothing. It didn't cost me anything. It just took a minute. Go ahead. Just Nick, just remember me later. Well, you tell everybody. You found an honest car repair guy. So crooks don't become rich. That's just a dadgum mythology by rednecks with poor mouthing. You know, that's the ones I grew up. Little man can't get ahead. Life is rough. People like us. You ever hear these people like Eeyore is their spirit animal? You hear them people? Yeah. Well, that, that's the ones tell you crooks are all rich people. All rich people are crooks. Well, bull crap, almost no rich people are crooks. Most of them are the, some of the more honest people you ever run into. That's how they got rich, dummy. They, they, they got a reputation for doing it right and bringing it, you know? Golly, this is silly. All right, let's go to Sarah in San Francisco. Sarah, what's your net worth? Um, about two point six million. Cool. And how much of that did you steal? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I couldn't resist after that last little rant. Okay, so give me a little breakdown by category. Um, my home is worth about eight hundred thousand, which mm -hmm. is all paid off. Mm -hmm. I have a vacation property in Mexico that. I owe about fifty thousand on. It's worth about seven hundred thousand. Good for you. Um, I have about one point two million in um, four hundred one k cash and other things. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well done. What? What? Where are you in Mexico with that vacation property? What city? Cabo. Cabo. Cabo San Lucas. Good for you. Fun. Very cool. All right. How old are you? 63. Cool. And how much of this did you inherit? I did actually inherit about 500000 mm -hmm. but I have not touched that. Mm -hmm. I, <clears throat> I don't want to take any money out because I don't want to pay taxes on it. Mm -hmm. But I haven't I haven't really used that for anything. Is that in the 2.6? Yes. Okay. And how much of that, did that come after you were already a millionaire or before you were a millionaire? Um, kind of in... Well, when you received kind of it, did you already money. have a million dollar net worth or not? I had part of it, maybe a half a million. Okay. So this helped make you a millionaire. Okay, good. Okay. So you did inherit part of it. That's good. All right. Now, so your income range, your best year working and your worst year working. My best year, probably around 230. My worst year in the last 20 years, probably around 20,000. Okay, cool. What do you what'd you do for a living? What was your career? 
Um, I am a physician assistant in the ER. Got it. Okay. And so obviously you got a PA degree. And what was your what was your GPA? Um, probably around three point three. Good for you. Okay. Cool. All right, you're talking. I, I met a young PA on a trip I was on the other day. Um, he was in his tw- well, I guess he's in his early 30s. But if you, if you're talking to a young PA in their 20s or 30s, can they still do this? Could they still become worth 2.6 million even if they didn't inherit half a million? Oh, definitely. Yes. Listen to Dave Ramsey. Invest in your company 401k property. Don't buy stupid things and invest your money. Wow. Rocket science. That's <laughs> impressive. And you just did that over a long period of time. You said over the last, how, how many years do you think you've really been kind of on a good financial plan? Actually, not that long. Um, probably 16 years. I was very, very sick. I had to change careers. I was a firefighter the first part of my life, and then I got injured, so I had to reinvent myself. So I went back to PA school I got very sick right after I graduated, and then I almost lost my house. So almost all of this has been in the last 16 years. Wow, wow good for you. Well, This done. has not been easy. Yeah, and you're 63, and the future is yeah. bright. Yes. And the sun's shining in Cabo. <laughs> yes, and I feel so free. So I bet free. you do. It sounds like you can work because you want to and not because you have to. Oh, exactly. I love my job now because I don't have to work and I don't have to work as much. So that is rare. You yeah. can do anything you want. All right. Do you read more yeah. books or watch more TV? Are you a book person or a Netflix person? Oh, I don't watch TV. There's too much life. I was in bed for two years, so I'm not watching TV. No, I'd rather go out and enjoy friends and family and life. There we go. Right there. Words from a millionaire. 63 years old, $2.6 million net worth. Very, very well done. By the way, the statistics on inheriting the money, uh, um, as we discovered when we were, uh, the reason I was asking her the questions the way they were is it fits the research that we did. Um, 79% of America's millionaires, with the largest study, airtight research, of America's millionaires ever done, 79% received an inheritance of zero. 5% received a very small inheritance, like Granny left them five grand. So mathematically, they were not millionaires because they got an inheritance. Another 5%, like her, received a substantial inheritance, but did so after they were already millionaires. Now, that part was not like her. This, her situation, literally, she did become, get her first million because of an inheritance. So she actually is one of the rare ones. But 5% a little bit, 5% after already millionaires, and 79% zero. Those three figures added together is 89%. 79 plus 5 plus 5. That's 9 out of 10 of America's millionaires are not millionaires because of inherited money. What's that mean? Number one, it means the communists out there telling you otherwise are lying Number two, it means you have a chance. She started 16 years ago. She's 63. Now, she did get an inheritance that helped her, but she's basically done most of her wealth building in the last little bit. This is a Baby Steps Millionaire Hour on The Ramsey Show. Baby Steps Millionaire's Theme Hour, George Camel, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host. Don is our next millionaire in Canton, Ohio. Don, what's your net worth? My net worth is $2.24 million. Cool. Give me a little breakdown by category. Well, uh, retirement accounts, we've got $1.9 million there. Uh, most of that's in uh, company stocks. I own about 98 uh, different companies there. Mm-hmm. And then also some mutual funds. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's all spread out in Roth and, and traditional. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got 
sixty-six thousand in HSA and um, forty-five thousand in, in cash in the bank. Mm-hmm. Our home's worth somewhere around one hundred and seventy, and personal property around thirty thousand. Wow, good for you. So most of this is a retirement account, then. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Good for you. How good old are you? Sixty-four. Soon awesome. to be sixty-five. Cool. All right. And how much of this did you inherit? None. Zero. And what was your best year working income and your worst year working income? Uh, my best year would have been uh, an outlier. I made uh, about uh, 148 that year, a mm-hmm. uh, big turnaround at the refinery. Mm-hmm. And then uh, way back in uh, 1980, I was making about 19000 Okay, cool. Cool. What was your career? I'm an electrician. I started out as a union electrician in the construction industry, and, and then uh, 15 years after that, I moved into the refining industry. So you did an as apprenticeship an rather than a four-year degree, I assume? Yes, it was an apprenticeship. Okay, right. cool, cool. So high, high school graduate then, right? Right. Okay, mm-hmm. good for you. Good for you. Well done. What was your GPA in high school? Do you remember? Uh, I think it was girls. Uh, it could have been better. <laughs> Might be the best answer so far. All right, I'm, I'm writing that one down. Oh, I like that. All right. it, it was probably in the, in the three range somewhere. It uh, I had the capacity to do much better, but uh, had distractions along the way. Yeah, I've heard about those you distractions. You didn't apply yourself. That's yeah. what we call it. <laughs> yeah. All right, so you're talking to a young guy who's heading into the trades going to be a plumber, going to be an electrician. He's 23, 25 years old, and he's listening right now, and I promise you he's listening. Uh, Can he still become a millionaire in America today based on your knowledge? He can, uh, but he needs to invest, or he needs to budget, first of all, and do all those basics because you got to have some headroom left uh, so you have something to invest. And, you know, I messed around until I was 37. I didn't start this until I was 37 years old. So I had to do a lot of catching up. But so yes, what you're telling him is, is he could have five to 10 million if he starts at 25. Yeah, exactly. He'd have a whole lot more than what I've done. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well done, sir. You're a hero. Proud of you. Thank so you. what, what, any other advice you would give to the listener out there that thinks you can't be a millionaire today or wants to know how to do it? Well, um, you know, stop playing around with with all the things that don't get you anywhere, like the credit card points and and things like that. They're just totally meaningless. Uh, The biggest thing in our uh, family would be uh, tithing and honoring God with tithes and offerings. And uh, it's very big for us. And and, uh, we think that the Bible does tell us that that a rich man can get into the kingdom of God as long as he honors God, puts him first, turns it all over to him, and and uh, operates in his principles. Amen. Uh, another thing is is I, what helped me over the years, I think, the most was just staying invested. Uh, time in the market and being invested in, in equities uh, and just being consistent, that's, that's really where I got where I was going. I, I'm not a genius. But I, I think I just did the, did the things uh, correctly there. Mm. I don't know if you're a genius or not, but I think you're very wise, and I'm very impressed. Very, very That's well good. done. Danielle is our next millionaire in Hartford, Connecticut. Danielle, what's your net worth? My net worth is $1.375 million. Got it. And uh, I'm going to call it one point four. Okay, and give me a little breakdown by category, please. Sure. It's about 187000 in cash. About two hundred fifty-six thousand in a brokerage account. Um, about seven hundred eighty-nine thousand in retirement, and I own a condo that's worth about two hundred and fifty thousand. Good for you. Well done. How old are you? Forty-six. Forty-six. You're single. Yes. Cool. And how much of this did you inherit? None of it. <laughs> okay. And uh, what was your best year working income so far, and your worst year working income so far? Best year working is probably going to be this year. Um, my base salary is about one seventy five. With bonus, it brings me up to a little over two. Mm-hmm. Um, worst year was probably when I started out of college. So I think I started off around thirty two thousand a year. Cool. What's your career? I am a procurement systems manager. So I manage a team of systems analysts that run um, the applications that support our procurement division. Got it. So your degree, information systems, or what? 
Actually, no. My degree's in healthcare. I went to school for health administration, but I somehow ended up in the insurance capital of the world. So uh, <laughs> that's where I reside right now. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay. So what was your GPA in school? 348. 348. All right. Cool. All right. And um, wow, good for you. So same question. Uh, the younger version of you is listening out there. Can they still do this? And if they can, what should they do? Without a doubt, they can do it. Um, I think they just need to be disciplined. I would say start investing right away. I know out of college when I had my first really big job, I invested 10% annually into my 401k. And just budget. You know, growing up, my parents uh, always taught us to distinguish between our wants versus our needs, right? And, you know, I don't replace things frequently. I run them until they break. And, you know, set aside discretionary income to do the things you enjoy, but also set aside things for, you know, a rainy day. Um, And just be very disciplined and be cautious. Hmm. That'll preach. I'm curious, Danielle, what car do you drive at 46 with a net worth of $1.4 million? A Subaru Crosstrek. <laughs> there we go. What year is it? It's a 2016. All right. Okay. Fantastic. So like every other millionaire we talk to, everyone would pass you in traffic and have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Trust me, I would love to have a really nice vehicle, but it's just, just not worth it. It's, it's a waste of money, and it's just, you know, I'd rather invest it into real estate. I mean, like I do, I, I do have 105000 left on my mortgage, but the goal is to eventually buy a house. Um, and that's really where I'm saving my money to go. Yeah. You're doing a great job. You're a that's hero. Impressive. So proud of you. Thank most, you for sharing your story. Most people are broke making 50 grand a year buying $60,000 cars. And Danielle's like, uh, cars aren't worth it. I got $300,000 in cash and it's not worth buying a new car. So yeah. take it from actual millionaires. They don't do that kind of stuff. Now, the other thing you need to distinguish, folks, is the difference in a billionaire and a millionaire. I talk about this in the Baby Steps Millionaire's book. I did a whole chapter on it because sometimes people think of a uh, think of a millionaire as being a billionaire. Millionaires do not have private jets. Period. Okay, they do not drive Lamborghinis. They don't have the money to. Okay, it's only a million dollars. You don't do private jets for a million bucks, okay? There's no, there's not one of those. And if you do, it's a freaking antique, okay? I wouldn't and, want to get in that so, thing. Yeah, I'm not riding in that thing. So, uh, and you know, Lamborghinis and two hundred fifty thousand dollar cars, that kind of stuff. That that's not, you know, seven cars, uh, three vacation homes around the world, a mountain home, a beach home, a whatever, a lake home. The millionaires, billionaires can do that, but a billion is a thousand million. You're a thousand millionaire. That's a lot different than being a millionaire. And so if you hear somebody's got seven cars, five, six houses, they've got a private jet, they're probably approaching or, you know, should be. At least DECA millionaire. Yeah, they, they, well, that'll millionaire. be well beyond. That'll be on beyond DECA. But anyway, but yeah, they're, they're north of probably 50 million at least and heading towards a thousand million. And, you know, a billion billionaires, that's You're not, not going to get there in your 401k. But there's not as many billion. There's a lot. There's about a 12 million millionaires in America. But there's not that many billionaires. Billionaires are a lot less. That's for sure. So, uh, and it is a different formula and a different setup. So when you think of millionaires, well, that, uh, you know, nobody needs that much money. This is not a moral construct. It's a math thing. Assets minus liabilities equals a million the only definition. Well, it's not enough money. We can discuss that, but that's not how you decide if you're a millionaire or not. We're talking to real millionaires and asking them how they got there. It's a Baby Steps Millionaires theme hour. the day proverbs 13 11 wealth obtained from nothing dwindles but one who gathers by labor increases it 
Will Rogers said, the quickest way to double your money is fold it in half and put it back in your pocket. <laughs> it's a Baby Steps Millionaires theme hour. We're talking to real millionaires. Matthew is one in Sarasota, Florida. Matthew, what's your net worth? Right around $1.8 million. Good for you. Give me a little breakdown by category. Yep. So we got about six hundred grand in retirement, five fifty in a separate brokerage account, a hundred thousand in cash, about fifty thousand in vehicles, and the house is probably about five and a quarter. Good for you. Well done. Cool. How old are you? Thirty eight. Good. And how much of this did you inherit? None of it. Zero. And your best yep. working year income and your worst working year income? So first five years of our marriage, probably around seventy, seventy-five thousand, and then got into real estate, hundred percent commission, and our best year was a little over five hundred. Whoa, Whoa, you're killing it! Good for you. Well done. So you're a real estate guy. Have you got a four-year degree? I do. Yeah, I got yeah. a finance degree. In finance, that sets you up. All right, good, good. And your GPA and your finance degree was what? Mm, probably about three point three. Okay, cool. So what do you attribute the fact that you're a millionaire to by the age of 38? What do you what do you say? People say, how'd you do that? What's the key? What, what do you tell them? $500,000 income doesn't hurt. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, that helps. But I would say listening to you, I probably started in my early 20s. And uh, that set us up in a way that I could take that leap in a real estate 100% commission, not knowing what we're going to make and uh, kind of weather that storm in the beginning. Good. Good for you. Okay, cool. So if a younger version of you uh, is listening, what do you tell them? Can it be done still? What's your philosophy yeah. on this? Yep, definitely can be done. Just um, be content with what you have and, and uh, you know, save it like you do and follow the plan and it gets there. Yeah. You, you sound like you're just, it's like a matter of fact. Yeah. 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 Do you ever uh, have any emotions about this when you hear these people saying that America's too broken to win and that anarchy is necessary and wealth inequality is crazy and it's unfair out there? Do you ever hear all that stuff? Yep. You know, I've been listening to the show, so I hear it all the time and uh, see it on the news, but um, just kind of keep doing what we've been doing for a while and it's been working out for us. Just ignore the noise. Yep. Create your own reality. Well, that's <laughs> impressive because a lot of people that are younger, they're going, well, I can't wait till 60 to have retirement. So therefore, what's the point in investing? They have a very doom and gloom, but you're 38 and you did this stuff. It's awesome. Well done, Matthew. Proud of you, man. Carrie's in Kansas City. Carrie, what's your net worth? Uh, 1.5 million. Good for you. And give me a little breakdown by category. Uh, 530,000 in the house. 450 in uh, 401ks, IRAs, and ESOP, uh, 475 in taxable brokerage account, and then 45 in cash. Cool. How old are you? Uh, 34. Whoa, our youngest of the day. Excellent. Good for you. How much of this did you inherit? Uh, we did not inherit any of it. Zero. And what's your worst year income working and best year income since you've been working? So about $45,000 when we got out of school, and since we've been married and combined, uh, 350000 Cool. What do you do for a living? So I'm a project director for McCarthy Building Companies, and my wife is a neonatal nurse practitioner. Okay. So a nurse, and you said you're a, you're a product director? Uh, project director. Project. So project oh, management. I got you. Okay. Yep. Okay. I got you. Okay. Before you said out of school, what was your degree in? I was construction management, and Liz went to nursing school. And she was nursing, of course. Yeah. Okay. And your uh, net, your uh, GPA, and when you were in school, I was at three point five, and Liz was at a four zero uh, through her graduate. Of course, she was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're a millionaire, <laughs> one point five million at thirty four years old. How did you do that? Uh, I'd say consistency um, and really setting goals. Um, I mean, I, I can't say I did the same thing when I was younger in my teens, but that was kind of the, the breaking point for me of just not wanting to live paycheck to paycheck. So, again, setting goals and being consistent, um, saying no to some of the things that don't carry a lot of value in our life. And um, as you get married, just being being on the same team, uh, same page goes a long way. So the force multiplier there. Yeah. 
Well, you've done this in a fairly short period of time, so obviously the answer to the question, can this still be done, you would say yes, I assume. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, do you guys watch more TV or read more books? Um, well, I, I listen to the, the podcast quite a bit and um, read more articles than chapter books. Mm -hmm. But Liz, uh, she reads more of the chapter books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um of course, we have our favorite shows here and there, but. <laughs> well, I'm really impressed. Did you have a strategy going into this? You know, when you were 24, were you like, hey, we want to get to a million by this age and here's how we're going to do it? Or were this, was it just these practices that landed you there? So I, I really didn't start listening to the show until about four, four or five years ago. Um, but kind of instilled from my my dad as far as just, you know, saving money and just be intentional with it. But when I was able to, to listen to the show and it really got me on track with a plan um, to get out of debt and then we kind of carried that through to be able to pay off the house on it too and just kind of kept that focus and it just it feels really good. Yeah. What really do you drive? Good. So uh, 2013 Lincoln MKX. Okay. <laughs> cool. So, nice. what, what, about, uh, what about your nurse wife? Uh, she's in a uh, Acura. Uh, MDX, yeah, I think, but certified pre -owned. Perfect, good, very good. Well, well deserved. What an amazing couple. You guys are heroes. Well done. All right, George. Just to make sure the mythology is destroyed, uh, the GPAs are 3.0, 3.3, 3.0, 3.48, 3.3, 4.0, and a 3.5. So there's no geniuses, but there's also no dummies. So I don't, I don't ever get 1.7, and I play beer pong. You know, I don't get that. I get, uh, you know, I generally get around a 3.0, and that's the what the research shows, too. Uh, inherited uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, inherited 5, inherited nothing, 1 inherited a half million that caused her to be a millionaire. So 1 out of 5 today, uh, and the statistics are uh, 1 out of 10 nationally. We kept the calls going. We probably yeah. have more zeros yeah. to get and us And the net worth on the people calling in, they were not $50 million. Uh, but these are actual millionaires, not your broke brother-in-law with an opinion. $1.7 million net worth, 2.6, 2.24, 1.4, 1.8, 1 1.5. Almost all of them, it's a major mix between their retirement and their home. Uh, very seldom was there anything else weird in there. We didn't hear any crypto. We didn't hear any uh, lotto. Uh, we didn't hear anything like that. There's nothing going on here. It's real estate, cash, and investments. Some of them did have some company stocks, but yep. that was it. Is that simple? Yep. And I didn't talk to any famous entertainers or athletes or, um, you know, uh, so they didn't inherit it. They're not crooks. They're not famous. They don't have super high GPAs. They're just people that work the system, just work the plan, and they did it over. And av the average, by the way, is about 17 years. And these people in here were talking, that guy there. Many said, of them he, said that. He got serious four years ago. Another one was 16 years ago since she got hurt on the fire department. Remember that and all that. And so what these are are regular people, an electrician, a PA, uh, a physician's assistant, uh, an attorney, a, a procurement, a guy, a real estate, nurse, project manager for construction company. I didn't hear brain surgeon in there. Or... Um, Nuclear engineer was not like an there. entrepreneur that owns their own business making a bajillion dollars. I, I didn't hear there. anybody. I took a company public. Now they all got their income up. Now they all raised some their dual income. income they, all, some they, of that all, helps. they all are learners, but they and they all a hundred percent believe not only it can it be done, but it should be done. Mm. So proud of you guys. Amazing. Baby Steps Millionaires theme hour. If you want to know more about that, pick up the book, The Baby Steps Millionaires. It's the latest number one I did. And the only reason I did it was because a bunch of you said it couldn't be done, so we proved to you that it can be done, and you're wrong. Don't tempt Dave with a good time and a challenge. That's it. That puts this hour of the Ramsey Show in the books. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. Hey, it's George Camel. If you like what you heard in this episode and want to know more about getting started on the Ramsey Baby Steps, go to RamseySolutions.com and click on the Get Started button. We'll help you figure out the best next step for you based on your specific situation. That's RamseySolutions.com and click Get Started.